Well, welcome, uh, Sade. Thank you uh, for being here, helping out, um, and hosting with co-hosting. This is Sade Brown, everyone. Hello. The lovely Sade Brown. Uh, Sheree, uh, our president. Yes. Um, thank you, Sheree. Um, so welcome to the uh, third biannual College Students in Broadcasting uh, Symposium, Reimagining Media. Uh, this talented panel that we've put together um, would like to speak with us uh, about their experiences in the field of media through rapid technological changes and consumer viewing habits. Um, the business models of uh, broadcasting has shifted and um, moved traditional uh, cornerstones of media uh, in the in, you know, throughout the the public. So we would first like to introduce a recent Becca graduate now working at Facebook. It would be Angeline Capati. <laughs> Next, a journalist and blogger at Bay Area News Group, a digital media first company writing for leading publications such as San Jose Mercury News and the Oakland Tribune. We welcome George Kelly. Next up, uh, co-founder of Creative Commons and an SFU lecturer. Please welcome Lisa Ryan. Thank you. Misha Leibovich is CEO and founder of the powerful online storytelling tool, Miograph. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I didn't tell him to say that. And we have, uh, well, one colleague is actually missing right now. He's a little late, but um, he covers stories and the, around the world receiving multiple Emmys from the local CBS affiliate KPIX. We welcome Ken Bastida. Well, we can get started. Um, first up, uh, thank you all for attending and coming and making some time out of your day. Um, it is a Saturday morning, we understand that, and we appreciate uh, your time. Uh, Angeline, you have a very interesting title at Facebook. I do. <laughs> Can you talk about what the Scaled Outreach Partnership team does? Yeah, so I am part of the Developer Scaled Outreach Partnerships team. I am a contractor, which means I'm employed um, by an agency that staffs for Facebook, um, and I'm my contract has been extended to July. What I do um, is work with uh, small to medium app developers that are kind of startups, I guess, and I onboard them onto the audience network, which is our mobile-based advertising network. Um, I also onboard them onto FB Start, which is our new program for app developers, where we give them consultations, like one-on-one -on -one consultations on getting their app up and running, as well as tools from some of our major partners, like Adobe, um, Parse, and Hootsuite. Um, and I mean, in between all that, I provide developer support, and I'm working on some other confidential projects. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, you know, the really the main idea of these symposiums are to give media professionals, uh, you know, an opportunity to let students and former students, alumni, uh, you know, to express how they got their jobs and, 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 and to start. Angeline, how, how did you land a job e e as a consulting position at Facebook? Yeah, well, I, st I was actually um, contacted by a recruiter. Uh, I had my resume on LinkedIn and Glassdoor and Monster, believe it or not. Some people still use that website. Um, and, a con and a recruiter contacted me and asked would I be interested in uh, working for the public content operations team for a short-term project. Um, and that project turned out to be the Facebook Mentions app, which is for celebrities and public figures, like Ken, for example, could probably have access to it. Um, it lets him see when his name is trending um, in news articles and on social media, and it lets him directly contact like his followers through Facebook. Um, so I did that for like a month. And then that contract ended, 
and I transitioned to the Developer Skilled Outreach Partnerships team after that. So just a traditional resume submission. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I was very fortunate that I didn't even know that, you know, a recruit at Facebook had been looking at my resume. You know, so they, the, they do scour LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and uh, Monster.com. So have a strong resume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Lisa. Okay. Can, uh, may I, is it, is it Angelina? Angelina, yes. Angelina, may I ask Angelina a question of first? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I just wanted to know what kind of stuff was on your resume. Because uh. <laughs> it's, it's uh, non-trivial to get a job like this right out of school. So I want to know what was on it. Curious. Yeah, no. So um, in call, while I was here at SF State, I worked for Nordstrom as a hostess in their bistro because, you know, every college student has to have that one job that just needs to pay the bills. Um, and then I worked, I also worked as a tutor um, for some middle schools in the mission for San Francisco Unified School District. Um, I was a TV production intern at K KMVT. 15, which is a community access television channel in Mountain View. Uh, I was also a promotions assistant for Mix 106.5 and 94.5 K-Bay for a while, too. That is on there as well. <laughs> yeah, it's Thank a long you. resume. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you. So, Lisa, um, your background is in uh, computer uh, development, software development? Not really. I mean... Website I mean, development? <coughs> My... You mean like my education? My education uh, is actually here. Well, you co-founded. You co-founded. I co-founded Creative Commons, and I I'm sort of a self-taught in uh, the computer, um, more of document formats than programming. I'm always okay. quick to differentiate. So, okay. since there's lots of people with actual computer science degrees that build software that runs, and I'm not one of them, I'm quick to separate myself out from them. Um, so my big computer claim to fame in that field is um, working on something called XML, which is something that if you're a computer programmer, it's just like the plumbing now. It's the most boring thing in the world. It's what everybody just uses so that apps can communicate with each other. But many years ago is where I feel like grandma, back like the beginning of the web, um, applications could not interoperate. Their, their data could not be shared. And not only if you wanted to uh, parse, which just means do something with a page of data, if you wanted to do anything with it, you had to write software sp specifically for that format. So um, XML was this thing that really had to happen. And I got involved with something called the W3C, which does the HTML and XML and all the other standards recently compromised by DRM, but uh, had been doing really well up until that point at keeping things standardized and open so that thing, things could develop, keeping an open playing field on the web. So that's my computer computer background. And I worked with the late Aaron Schwartz on developing the um, RSS-based format for um, copyright licensing information that, again, is sort of now just comes along with everything. You don't even think about it, a lot of the licensing information. But um, we had to get that going a long time ago so it would be there for when there were actually software applications that knew how to use it, if it makes any sense. So, so how important is it to copyright your information? You know, you're, you're out all creating content and writing content. I mean, mm -hmm. is it something that should be sort of the next step once you conceptualize something? What is something that should be the next uh, should step? Should copyright um, Well, licensing? actually, unfortunately, you don't have any say in the matter. As soon as you create something, it's automatically under copyright in this country. <laughs> and really in the rest of the world in different ways, it's, you, that's the point. So even if you wish to share something, um, a lot of times you've already given your rights away without realizing it to a corporation or somebody else that's been involved in the, pr in the process. So how does Creative Commons fit in, fit in with that? So Creative Commons comes up, um, what we did was we came up with a set of licenses to make it easy for people to release their works under different kinds of licenses. So if, if you think of copyright as all rights reserved, don't do a single thing with my work unless you talk to me about it and get something in writing from me giving you explicit permission for doing so. Creative Commons licenses give you some rights reserved. So you can still protect yourself from commercial uses is the important thing. So somebody can't just rip you off, make a bunch of money off your song, let's say. Song scenario is kind of easiest to think about all this stuff. 
And Creative Commons licenses are just like card catalog information about your song, author, subject, title, URL, and license. And how do you pick your license? Because who the hell has time to learn about copyright law? You pick your license from a form with just a series of yes or no questions. And um, so you can just say commercial use is okay or not okay, educational use is okay or not okay, and it generates a license for you in human readable form, in a huge, big, long, uh-oh, my microphone's not gonna let me do it, in a huge, big, long license, <laughs> um, and then in this computer readable form, which is in that XML format that I, that I was talking about. And that's because, again, we don't wanna be thinking, you only wanna think about this stuff when you're choosing your license, then you just want it to be attached to your song as it moves around on the internet. And the point is that information is there, everybody knows where to find it, nobody can say they didn't know when they ripped you off, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and, and the teachers also know that it's okay to use, which is important too. And the whole point, this department actually has a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share alike. I think you did go for the share alike, which means um, that you just have to give proper attribution and you, have, and you can't use it for commercial uses. Um, so nobody can take a student project and, and rip them off. And share alike keeps it in the community. Uh, it means that nobody can take something that sort of came from the community and then put it out in a commercial way that can't then also be remixed. How different is that than, than, than publishing that typical, a, song, you know, a songwriter will typically go through, they'll you know, register their songs through BMI. You don't have to register anything, it's, it's automatic. The copyright is, as soon as you write the letter on the page, we like to say, <coughs> That is, is copyrighted. So you don't need to send yourself anything in the mail or anything like that. If you're worried about, if you really think <clears throat> that you're, um, if you're worried that the band member that you just broke up with is gonna rip off your song and it's your song anyway, you could send yourself something in the mail, I guess. You just wanna have some kind of evidence for that battle later. But, um, but th I mean, that's what, what people were thinking when they used to tell you like that and, and the, um, the record labels want you to <coughs> think about this process, this official process of registering everything so that they can kind of keep control of it. And um, it can come in handy when you want to get paid uh, if you happen to um, be on a, a record label and you have agreements in place. I'm not saying that um, copyright in theory is a wonderful thing. The idea is paying artists for their work and that's what everybody wants. But then they've got to be in a problem where, <coughs> excuse me, combination of things like orphaned works, historical things that are out of print, unavailable, but the publisher that has control just doesn't feel like putting them out anymore. So do we just lose that book now? We just not get that book anymore? Uh-uh, we scan it, it goes up on the internet archive because that is an orphaned work and it needs to be preserved for the public domain. So um, in those kinds of ways, copyright is a hindrance to things that arguably are in the public interest. Interesting, okay. Uh, real quickly, um, when students graduate, should they be familiar with any type of programming language? Uh, you know, in, in terms of like securing a more translatable job um, from, you know, like any production work that they might do here, uh, you know, just HTML knowledge or... Right, I, knowledge. I think primarily in our field, it's gonna be your CMS experience, if they care about your technical experience, it's, it's gonna be, if you've had any like editing experience working for a newspaper where you're checking in stories, I think blogging is really important. George can tell you a lot more about this than me as far as what the requirements are these days for news people. But basically, yeah, anything like that, and, and writing is key, being able to really show that you can write for all these different platforms. Um, you know, everybody can tweet and stuff like that, but can somebody put up a Facebook post and a big blog post that links to the Facebook post and your whole big production of your thing that like comes out on Monday morning on the web and everybody knows about it in 48 hours? Can you do that? That's the kind of stuff that will separate you. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is for George. Um, as technology rapidly changes, 
do you find yourself in response adjusting your workflow? Yes. <laughs> Great response. George, George for you. Uh, your workflow uh, has to adjust because you want to be able to respond to changing circumstances. Every day it seems like we're paying more attention to the news and news stories update rapidly in real time. So you have to operate not only uh, from a point of being flexible, but from a point of principles. One of the very important things that Lisa and other folks impressed me with when it came to Creative Commons was my degree of choice when it came to content creation, when it came to releasing material out into the world. That's why when I signed up for Flickr, a photo sharing account, I enabled a Creative Commons license on my photos so that other people could use them. Uh, I figured it was just part of the rent I'm paying on being out there in the world contributing to you know, material. Uh, there are some materials that I might want to have different licenses on though and you know, Creative Commons made it easier for me to to use and to explain to others, which is a big part of my job as an online coordinator at the Bay Area News Group. I'm doing a fair amount of training and showing people not only what tools other people are using, the people formerly known as the audience are using, but what tools they can use and get up to speed on in order to translate their stories into different formats. Uh, once you start with the first principles, you can begin to exercise the flexibility and tool choice and platforms. You're seeing some of that in your own work as well. People having to uh, work with different tools to uh, connect with the social graph that so many people are interested in in Facebook and the interest graph that people are starting to tap into with services like Twitter or uh, if you're using a, a Tumblr or a Pinterest. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so our next question would be, what are some qualities that hiring managers might look for at Bay Area News Group? <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> you want to be able to demonstrate that you've used everything that you can bring to the table. I am in newspapers because my brother, my younger brother, Aaron, was the uh, station manager for the campus radio station at Bowie State University in Bowie, Maryland. And he wanted someone to come in and read the news in the mornings to go over the state, uh, over the student center airwaves. So he knew I liked to talk. <laughs> I liked to write, so I would come up with short, precise news summaries. That led the campus newspaper editor to come in and ask if I wanted to work for the paper. When he left, I wound up succeeding him. That led to an internship that brought me out here to work at the Oakland Tribune in the summer of 94. And I caught the first Greyhound back out here in 95 and started working as a general assignment reporter. <coughs> I've also done work at Bang as um, a copy editor, uh, a page designer, and probably the strangest thing I did this week was voiceover work for a film that's going to be released as part of an installment of a series uh, that's, that'll probably be released a little later this month. You have the voice for it. You're that's too it. kind. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be versatile, be open to doing a lot of things. You have to be versatile. You have to be willing to experiment. You have to look at a variety of different platforms and formats. You have to do things on your own. You have to demonstrate that you play well with others. So to the extent that you tap into tools that let you collaborate with others, uh, you're going to be a lot better off. And especially when it comes to positioning yourself, not just for hiring, but for the networking that will lead to the job after the job. So many of us are looking at our careers and maybe expressing worry and concern rightfully, but we have to think 
not just about the one job we want to get. We have to think about two or three jobs beyond that. We want there to be uh, an arc. We want to create a narrative, not just in our work, but in our careers. Yeah, Thank I, you. And I just wanted to emphasize George's first point was that not only getting all the different kinds of experience that he mentioned, but it, remembering to express it well in your resume so that it really gets across without it being too long or um, seeming like all these things you're talking about, your kitchen, you know, everything but the kitchen sink, sort of keeping it focused, but making sure that you really do include everything you've been doing if you've been doing all that stuff, because you don't know which of those things is gonna strike inside the head of the person that's looking at that resume. Nicely said. Yeah, it's a long mic, it's totally, it's a wobble. Thank you, by the way, for both response. So, Misha, yep. storytelling is an art form, which I know. Um, so does Miograph allow everyone to become a storyteller? Yeah, so um, first of all, did you really take an, a greyhound across the whole country? Twice. Oh my god. <laughs> you ever take a greyhound to like a town away? It's crazy, just doing that. <laughs> I actually just wanted to hear him talk again. It's like sitting next to Ron Swanson here. It's like warm <laughs> with mold wine right in my core. It's awesome. Um, storytelling. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, my, my company's called Meograph. Um, we actually have a new app called Trio. So all of you with iPhones, I want you to download it. T-R-I-O uh, and mash up. Um, we focus on letting people be able to create rich media and express themselves. Um, you know, a lot of it, we're trying to address the, the difficulties of, of creation. So part of it is uh, the interfaces that you use. Um, and for any of you that try to use um, things like Final Cut Pro or, you know, Premiere, like they're very powerful, but, but difficult, um, you know, pretty high barrier to, to entry. So, uh, so we tried to make it easy and fun interface but also solve a lot of the creative problems around creation, like assets. Where do they come from? This is you know, a lot of stuff with Creative Commons too, like relying on people to gather their own assets if they want to create every time is really difficult. How are you gonna do something about Syria and give an opinion on that without actually going to Damascus and capturing things on your iPhone? So, not advisable, by the way. Um, so like, how do you give people access to the assets that they would need and let them make it easy and fun while also being respectful of the content uh, owners? Uh, and how do you attribute properly and all that? Um, trying to solve problems around inspiration. Like if you're just an average, um, you know, like you're not maybe a professional editorial person, but you still want to be creative and express yourself, how do you come up with ideas for, for what to create? So we try and solve that within the app with uh, this thing called challenges where it's, you have these like sort of meme-like things where there's topics that you can create around and then the, um, the content is grouped around that. Um, and to really turn creation from a what the heck do I do question into a yes or no, do I want to do this? Do I want to do this? Do I want to do this? Um, and uh, inspiration, or uh, incentives rather. Uh, why are you gonna story tell? Why are you gonna create? Some people got a story tell and create so bad that they're just gonna do it on their own and you know, and they don't need any um, nudge or push at all. But most people, if you can give them the incentive of like, your friend invited you to do this, like other people are creating around the same topic. Um, having this sort of really collaborative community feel and the social reward that comes from that, um, that can solve a lot of the problems around like, why am I creating and, and why now? Uh, so all that sounds very kind of like uh, abstract, but uh, you know, if you, kind of look at our products and the evolution of those products, you'll see how those, um, those philosophies are sort of enacted and trying to really put something in someone's hand um, that they can just in intuitively and immediately figure out, here's why I'm creating, what I'm creating, and how I'm gonna do it uh, really, really quickly. Trying to have a very low cost of time and effort spent for a very high psychic and social reward. So we're trying to turn people into, I think everyone has things to say, everyone has stories, mm -hmm. 
um, but we're really just trying to lower the the bar on every creative respect uh, to entry. All right. Uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, what advice would you give to students starting their own production companies? Own production companies. So just like general, how to yeah, like business. how do you? I know you're an entrepreneur. You create it. You're the CEO. Sure, so. sure, sure, sure. Um, my mom tells people at the gym that her son is a big CEO. My mom, it's a very small company. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, so I started my company when I was 28, um, you know, and I went to, let's see, I was an engineer, undergrad, I actually studied aerospace engineering in grad school because I thought I wanted to be an astronaut, and then I was a strategy consultant for a while, and so it took me a while to, to get to it. So one thing is that if you want to do it right out of school, like, groovy, go for it, but if you're not quite ready yet or you don't quite know what you want to do yet, like, that's cool too. Like, it's not too late at, at any point. Um, <coughs> the, I think a lot of it was just having the, 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 a good enough idea, knowing that it's going to change, like, for sure. Like, our earliest products barely resemble um, what we have now. Um, and uh, having the, you know, seeing where you can actually build a business, of course, um, you know, some businesses make money right away, some take a little while and maybe are worth more later, but like figuring out how that works for you and where you fall on that spectrum. Um, and then uh, having the right, I mean, obviously working your butt off, um, being, being humble and listening uh, to people tell you what's right and what's wrong and not taking it personally and just working to fix whatever you're doing. And I'd say having the proper expectations. Like my expectation going into the company was that we would suck for three years and accomplish nothing, um, and then maybe it'd get better. Um, I think we were like moderately successful in the first two years, and so still not still nothing big yet. But um, I think having those expectations that things take a while, that every overnight success is like five six years in the making, um, and just not getting frustrated. Um, that just to keep keep going. I think. Given enough intelligence, hard work, humility, and patience, um, then you can have success. But that patience is is key, and you know you can't uh, you can't pay the rent on patience, uh, with patience rather. So um, so how do you support yourself during all that time? That uh, was my next question. Exactly. That was how did you keep actually. your company going for five years as a startup? Because it's really as a failed as a failed startup founder. It's very hard. How did you do it? Sure. Well, so it's, it's been two and a half years for, for us so far. Um, you know, some of it was, uh, you know, we raised a small amount of money from investors. Um, some of it was before, um, before I had this job, I was working for McKinsey. It's a big consulting firm, you know, got paid well, and I just, like, stashed away cash, like, as much as I could, um, knowing that I, what I wanted to do next. Um, so I was able to have some freedom there. Um, and uh, I mean, I live cheaper now than I did as a grad student. So um, cans of tuna, man, just cans of tuna. Um, and so it's just you know having that, uh, you know having that like you know it, obviously at, at the end of the day money runs out at some point. But I think we've been lucky in finding investors and customers along the way, and uh, just being willing to to live really really uh, cheap uh, for a while. And you planned it out. You planned it out in advance, it sounded like. You budgeted for the three to five years that things might take, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, hard to do. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not super fancy. So, like, so I don't, you know, like, it was easy for me to save money, save money then. But, yeah, having it go towards, like, something, you know, something I had in mind was, uh, you know, it, it, it also made it more real, like, as I was working at my last job, I feel like I'm saving this stuff for a reason. Um, and more of a push to actually then like, okay, let's get started. You know, it's it's easy to to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait to start a company, but it never gets easier. And um, unless you're super lucky, it never takes a short amount of time. So um, whenever you feel ready, um, that's the time to, or feel almost maybe not quite ready, uh, that's the time to, to get started. Yeah, you one know more question. I'm sorry, because it's really important. And I, I know there's some people in the audience already, I think that are students of mine that are thinking about starting their own company. And I want to talk about this. How many employees do you have? So currently, there's two of us. We've cycled between two and eight. 
Um, and we this is our third generation product that we have right now. That's um, it's in the App Store right now. Again, remember download Trio mashup uh, in the App Store. Um, the, but the uh, you know so yeah. Well, with our last product, we were up to eight people, and it's very much cycles. You know, you like to have a big sprint. You're building, you're building, you're building. Okay, you kind of wait to see how's it work. Okay, this one doesn't quite work. Like, you know, like let go of some people, mostly like contractors, and then ramp up again, or sort of like develop. Do we have something that works? Okay, now let's sprint on it. Okay, um, may maybe not. And so we sort of cycled between that. Um, and with the two people, just me and my co-founder, um, it's it's great. You know, it's, it's an awesome environment. It's really a creative and collaborative um, partnership. Um, with uh, with more people, there's more challenges, of course, but you get more stuff done uh, as well. So uh, we've kind of cycled between depending on our needs and, and resources. Okay, and that's really smart because that was one of the mistakes that we made was we had um, six people and eventually eight people that we had on salary, whether or not we really were in a crunch development mode yeah. or not. And um, so the money ran out and it's, <laughs> and I found out it was the same old story for a lot of places. And so that's really smart, yeah. you know, what you guys do and that way. So you and your friend can start a company and hire the people you need for the projects that you need them. And, and the outward facing can look just as good as a whole team of people with Absolutely. billions of dollars behind them. Okay, so that, that was the takeaway I was trying to get. And sure. I didn't know you were gonna be such a wonderful example oh, yeah. of that. And it's really great. Okay, yeah, thank no, you, I'll give you your show back, I'm sorry. No, no, no that's okay. These, <laughs> these are a lot of the questions. No, uh, it, it, if you guys are looking to do that, um, you know, like it is true, like keep costs as low as possible. Like we don't have an office. Uh, my co-founder lives in Atlanta. Um, we both just kind of like go where we, where we wish. Um, yeah, like it's, you know, I don't like to have to compete for talent in the Bay Area, um, when you know Facebook is paying their interns seven thousand dollars a month, um, I read an article recently. Like we can't compete with that, so um, we get developers in like Eastern Washington and Vermont, and uh, you know, in places where people are talented, but it's not as uh, it's not as expensive um, as this area. And there's so many tools out there to have um, remote work be possible. Um, that uh, I mean, it's not a lot different, to be honest, at least from our perspective. Everyone gets their stuff done, and uh, we save a lot of money by, by doing that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask Ken a question. I know he's part of a larger organization, and I wanted to know how he's seen that organization shift to handling time, handling resources, not necessarily thinking like a startup, but being more flexible to accommodate both the needs of younger folks coming into the industry and veterans who could stand to learn a new trick or two? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, the term new media, old media, it's, it's sort of being blurred now every day because what was old is new now. And if you're not new, you're going to be left behind. I think it took the networks a while to learn that lesson. Some of the more established companies uh, who provide content, but they're learning it. And um, it's a huge uh, prerequisite now for anybody who comes into our business to be really comfortable with both aspects. Um, we're in the content business. I mean, we make the, the story about you know, how much the interns make at Facebook that probably was generated by a traditional news media source. Um, so we're in, we, we make the sausage, we, we, um, the people back here with the cameras, the audio people, I mean, we're sort of the nuts and bolts of, of how all this information gets disseminated to a great extent. Um, that's changing somewhat and we collaborate a lot with different companies and we're very comfortable in doing that. Um, we also have, um, all kinds of new divisions within CBS and most of the big networks now are are starting to move into providing um, sort of non-traditional programming. Uh, CBS is going to launch a, a new project. I think it's probably about six, seven weeks old. It's called Access, uh, where you can pretty much um, get whatever programming you want uh, a la carte like by, just, by just going. On. It's, it's kind of like on demand, yeah. And they use the vast CBS library uh, for whatever you want. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's changed. I mean, um, 
you know, I left this building in the late 70s and, well, there was no internet. These didn't exist. Um, you know. So, I mean, we were in shooting film and processing and videotape and those things are pretty much dead now. Has uh, there been anything that you've taken uh, that sort of stuck with you in your career that you've learned here? Oh, definitely, yeah. That's what I'm talking about is, you know, really, I mean, <coughs> despite how you want to, you know, how you want to channel your career, there's still some really basic stuff you have to learn. Um, somebody mentioned good writing. That's probably first and foremost, I would say. Um, production values, just um, correct lighting, um, you know, making sure things are in focus, um, making sure you can communicate well. There are all kinds of great new tools to help you do that. And you're going to have to, as you know, the next wave of professionals going out there, learn how to utilize all those things. But it's still, it's still, you know, we still make spaghetti sauce the same way. We take tomatoes, we cut it up, we put it in a pot. You still have to have the basic tools to be successful. And the better you are at um, sort of combining all those skills, um, the better you're going to be. Now, this guy walking in right here fashionably is a colleague of mine. His name is Rick Villa Roman. We didn't plan this. He's just late. <laughs> Sorry. They say the first rule is to be on time, and I wasn't today. But, you know, Rick and I have probably similar career paths, a um, little more uh, traditional media. If you want to call it old media, that's cool. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Um, it's, it's, it's really down to the basics for us. I mean, uh, we, we see stuff on Facebook and stuff on YouTube, and it's out of focus, and it's jiggly, and, and that's cool. I mean, that's, that's fine. That's, that's a certain genre that we respect, and we really think it's neat. We actually take a lot of stuff from the public and air that stuff in a professional setting. Um, but we are also very prideful of the fact that most of our stuff, not all of it, looks good on the air, sounds good on the air, you enjoy it on a, you know, either a, a 60 inch TV screen or a, a six inch, it doesn't really matter. And we don't really care that much in our business about how it's disseminated. Because the we're, we make the sausage every day. So we, it, it doesn't matter how it goes out, what format it, it leaves, because that's gonna change constantly. And I mentioned videotape and film and all those things that are gone now. A lot of our stuff now, just somebody asked me she asked me a little bit earlier, um, you know, do you have an archive of things? I, I've been in this business 36 years. I don't have a single air check of anything I've ever done. And I'm on the air every day. So I, I don't know the value in keeping any of that stuff. It's gone that fast. So it's this constant machine that we have to feed every day in my business. Um, and so all these great tools that these people are going to be talking about are absolutely the future and absolutely fantastic. And you need to embrace those because our business changes every day. We're used to that. It's just uh, it's a fact of life and what we do. Yeah. How do you guys adjust to that? How do you adjust to new technological? Like, well, you know, I mean, just a, a real sort of pragmatic example would be, I mean, for a while the industry was, uh, we, we were all editing on Avid yeah. systems. And then, you know, that, that changed over to a Final Cut. Express, Final Cut Pro, now we're into Edius, uh, which is like Final Cut on steroids. And, you know, I mean, within, literally within six months, it'll be something else. So if you're coming into this business and you want to work, you know, for a big media company, if you want to call it that, um, they're going to expect you to be cutting edge, to know exactly what's going on with respect to wireless and, uh, um, you know, production value and what they expect to see. There's a certain standard, al albeit it has changed over the years. Um, I think, I think um, our viewers now, our listeners on radio, are probably, it's a different generation. They're more used to seeing things that are not traditional. And so we respect that as well. Um, that's why we use a lot of public content. Um, I think it's really exciting what you were talking about, about uh, showing people the tools in being able to express themselves and um, go out and build their own um, stories, for lack of a, of, of a better explanation. Um, that's cool. We love that stuff. We're giant providers, so we'll take anything you have 
and find a way to get it on the air and then we can charge all those people like the Comcast and the Dish Network. Oh, we're having a big yeah. fight with them right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and all the, the Time Warner people who buy content from us. So we make this stuff every day. We ship it out around the world. If we're really smart, we syndicate it and it goes to South America and Asia and Europe and we just keep chugging this giant machine. That's, That's a good uh, segue. So everyone, this is uh, Rick Villaroman, my cousin. He's a crew chief <laughs> with uh, Ken over at <coughs> KPIX. Um, Rick, you've done a lot of traveling yeah. uh, in your career, both with Ken and other uh, anchors and reporters. Yeah. How can students and other graduates really prepare for a, a global perspective when they're, when they're out in the world? Well, I mean, for me, I, I was totally unprepared. You know, it, my first big trip out of <coughs> the country, like way out of the country, was uh, Lebanon. Oh, wow. So what year that, was that? Uh, that was in 2001. Oh, wow. Okay. And since then, Ken and I have been a couple of times, and I've been a total of six times in the Middle East. Uh, I think we went two or three times. Yeah, went a few times. And, different uh, environment. I mean, you just do it. You yeah. just jump in, both feet, and you know, just get the work done uh, as, safe, as safely as you possibly can, of course. But right. uh, nowadays, there's less travel, particularly uh, for the local yeah. stations. They just don't want to spend the money. Do they have these other resources? Well, uh, these other well, uh, the, the world has changed. Uh, cell phones have changed everything. Computers have changed everything. We're constantly pulling stuff off of YouTube or whatever social media to, and we air it. Yeah. You know, uh, and so not only are you having to curate social media elements that you find, you're having to fact check and verify. That's the key point. Right. Is just because you can do this does not make you a journalist. Right. Okay. <laughs> because half the stuff on this is bullshit. <laughs> and you guys know that. I mean, you have to check everything. Everything has to be. That's where, and our stuff is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But there's so much out there that is not checked. And so many people make decisions in their lives and about how they're going to go about things based on what they see on the internet. Um, just be really careful. Be good consumers. Um, and be, you know, you guys have an advantage you're sort of in the know and how all this works and you're going to learn more as you move on to your careers. But um, I mean, in every one of these aspects, right? I mean, authenticity and um, corroborating facts, fact checking, it's sort of a lost art and uh, we constantly get burned by it. And um, we constantly have to check it and sort of hang our reputation on it. So uh, there's, there's some absolutely groundbreaking, spectacular journalism being done by individuals who don't work for big media companies and they're on their own. But there's also some absolute garbage out there that is completely false <coughs> and nonsense and made up and it's done for a quick buck. So just tuck that away. Hey Ken, though, what about the garbage that's coming out over the majors these days? What's your opinion about that? Yeah, What's no going question on? about it. I mean, uh, well, uh, look at Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, this week is now sort of not quite, but kind of retracting a story about uh, uh, the U of A oh, supposed yeah. rape that took place. And now they're saying that they can't really trust uh, the individual who claimed that this attack was something that happened in a fraternity. And so it's, it's those things. I mean, that's, that's part of journalism. We used to have old rules like you had to have three different sources before you could go on the air with something. Um, we still try to stick to that. But if somebody, I mean, you guys know, if somebody comes to us and they say, hey, look at this. I mean, I got a great piece of video here of a car exploding on 280 and uh, all the people inside were killed. Um, you know, our management team has to sit there and say, were there really lives lost here? Do we know that? Let's call San Mateo County and find out. So there is some fact checking that goes on, but things do get past us and we're not perfect. But a Rolling Stone at least drew attention to it and retracted mm -hmm. when they realized their error. And I think a lot of other organizations, there's some interesting stuff going on at the S St. Louis Post-Dispatch right now that's being republished all over the place 
What about when they find out they are in error and they do not retract? Yeah, it doesn't do them any good. I mean, uh, because of this age of social media and information, it's constantly moving at, at light speed. Um, if you're lying, it's going to get out. There's just no way. I mean, Isn't it different, though, to draw attention, to be make sure that the truth gets out when you see, find oh, out yeah. an error as, as opposed to... As far as your responsibility, yeah. I, story I, gets I, out. I always laugh at, like, you know, athletes and people who get caught in these weird situations and... Uh, they oh, continue yeah. to deny, 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 and you just know they're going to get caught. You know, they're going to they're going to get found out eventually. It's just too many people with too many sources, and you just there's just no way to hide things anymore. Um, and there's a million examples of that. And uh, I mean, really, as far as journalism is concerned, and, and however you want to look at that or define it, um, I think I think you know if you had one word that you wanted to hang your career on as you go forward is tell the truth, the truth. Just be truthful. Um, if it's true, it's true. <laughs> Sounds simple. But that's really what the whole thing is kind of key upon is if, if you're doing this and, and you're telling people, hey, this is what really happened, then make sure it's what really happened. Cool. It's that Thank simple. You. Yeah. Truth being honest in your word. Got to be true. That's all you yeah. really have. And then you um, become known as someone who tells the truth and verifies their story. Absolutely. Right, and I'm, I'm hoping that m we can bring that back. And you know, so it really it makes me, it excites me as someone who is still on the news, as someone who, um, and I wanted to ask you a question before I, because <laughs> as someone, because I, well, because again, I, I watch you all the time to the point where I wasn't even sure what channel you were on. It, you know, when, yeah. when you got here, I was like, oh, hey, I see him every night. What would your, um, recommendation be to people who want to be an anchor these days. What, God. Talk about something that's changed a lot, right? <coughs> I mean, what, what can you tell people? I would say don't go into it uh, wanting to be an anchor. Uh, go into it with all the bullets that you can carry. Uh, yeah. Learn how to edit. Learn how to write. Learn how to shoot. Learn how to uh, read a map. Learn, just learn as much as you can about all the different aspects. If it, and, then, and then when you do get a chance to sit in front of a microphone and somebody turns prompter on, you know, don't look like an idiot. Read the prompter and, you know, be good at all those things. The more you know about this business, and all these businesses are the same, the more ammo you bring in there, the harder it's going to be. Hey, can you, can you cut on Final Cut? Yeah. Uh, how about Edius? Um, kind of. Learn Edius. Learn Final Cut. Say yes to everything. Learn how to, you know. <laughs> ask you. Say, yes. Say yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, and then, if you and have then a then little experience if in If that it, doesn't work, yes, lie. Okay. Just say, yeah, I can do that. Uh, the, this question uh, is, is, is for Rick. Um, so you've been in this business sort of, uh, I don't want to say learning as you go, but really cutting your teeth as you go. That's um, true. You know, coming in, working at a, a local station, mm -hmm. and then to a major affiliate. Um, you know, throughout your career, what sort of um, barriers to entry that you have seen younger people facing uh, in terms of like characteristic things, like Ken was talking about, you're being truthful and, and just right. having accountability. Uh, well, like I just said, you know, saying yes to everything is for a person of my position now. I appreciate the younger people who just say yes. I can do that, or I can learn that. Um, it's really important to get uh, your em potential employer to trust you. Trust is everything. And uh, if I believe in a person, even if they don't have the skill that they said they have, right. I'm willing to work with them and train them. Uh, so saying yes to everything, being just being there, and I wasn't today. I apologize to the panel and <laughs> you guys. <laughs> But being there is huge. You know, I'm going to be where I say I'm going to be. Uh, getting there is half the battle. So. I, I would only add, um, yeah, it's all about attitude when you're starting out. Yeah. And, you know, you can go a long way with just uh, like what Rick said. And, you know, somebody comes to Facebook and, and they're a potential candidate for a job. It's like, hey, I'm willing to learn. I'll work whatever. Um, and, you know, going down the line, money should never be the motivating factor. It should never ever be what drives you. Okay, that's so far down the line. Um, first job I took was working in a mail room at a radio station just because I wanted to get into the radio station. 
I didn't care. It had nothing to do with radio. I, they said, hey, there's a job for a mailroom guy. If you want to do that. And I said, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. And it was like $3 an hour. And, yeah. uh, but it was a great move because I got in to a real station and I got to meet all these really cool creative people in sales, in engineering, in marketing, uh, in the news departments. Um, and I got, I got to see how they work. And I kind of just was a rat inside this station looking around at everything. I said, okay, this is what I want to do. Just get in. Just get in. And the way you get in is when they say, hey, uh, you know, we do have a guy that's supposed to work Christmas Eve, but um, he's mm -hmm. going to his parents' house or something. I'll be there yeah. Christmas Day. doesn't matter. I'll work. Saturday, Sundays, yeah. Uh, midnight, yeah. doesn't matter. It's raining outside, yeah. It's snowing, yeah, I'll go. I don't care. You always want to be known as the person who says yes. You never, ever, ever, ever want to say no. Never. Somebody told me one time the way to get into this business and all these businesses, and this is going to sound extreme, is to do it as if your life depends on it. If you mm. don't have that drive and attitude, then stand up now and leave. Because you are not, there's so many more people out there that are going to bust their ass to beat you out. And they're good. They're really good editors, really good shooters. These guys are already on platforms like this with their, with their iPhones, and they're out there shooting and editing their own stuff, and they're sending stuff to networks all the time. They're smoking good. And we might as well hire them than hire you if you're not willing to say yes. Never say no. Ever. That's, that's Thank basically you guys. the whole thing. We want to open up um, uh, you know, the, the floor for anybody who has any questions for any of our panelists. Um, so uh, definitely please uh, step up here. We have. Uh, little area we can, if anybody has any questions, nobody, anybody, somebody, <laughs> yes, you can speak wherever you want, I don't have a certain length of course, so. <laughs> but you definitely got to stand up, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, for people that are trying to be like entrepreneurs like some of yourself, um, is it, uh, what's like, your number one advice on getting started and getting out there to anybody. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'd say number one thing is, you know, learn your space really well. You know, know like the, not only the competitive landscape, but also like, cause that's, that's determines like, you know, there's a lot of people trying to do stuff in any given space and you can see what's good, what's bad and what's missing. Um, then you can figure out where to go with that. Um, I think depending on the nature of the business, like me having a tech company, I have a technical background, but I'm not a developer and that, um, is challenging uh, for me. And I wish that I had more, I can understand what's going on, but I wish I could direct it a little bit better. Um, I've, I've learned over, over the years, but, um, the, the deeper background you can have in whatever technical aspect it is, if you're going to have people working for you, you need to have a good intuition for if things are going good or bad. Um, and you only know that by understanding it from a, from a deeper technical perspective. So um, that's what I'd say. And, you know, just like have, yeah, just, just have a good idea ultimately for the business where the money's coming from. Like doesn't got to happen right now, but you need to know like who are you providing value for and how and why are they going to pay you for it? And that ultimately needs to work for the businesses to, to work. Any other questions? Uh, just come on up. We need you uh, to stand in the light. Phil? Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. right here, right here, buddy. <laughs> just, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Philip Ralpock. Um, I just graduated in May, and so I'm still trying to look for work. And I'm wondering a couple things. Uh, you know, I am a little bit older than most of the students that would have graduated this year. Um, how much would that affect? you know, people wanting to hire me, uh, being that I'm not in my 20s anymore. Uh, let's start with that. Older is better, yeah. <laughs> 100%. And uh, even though you can't say things like that when you're interviewing people, you, don't really? even, you can't even say things like that in the meeting before you interview people. Just hot tip, don't say something stupid at your business meeting, okay? <laughs> but since we can talk, you want that experience. 
Now, if some guy gets out of college or a girl gets out of college and they have all this experience and they're fresh out of college, you're not going to hold their age against them. But if someone has had some sort of life experience on top of their college experience, if they've had a job somewhere, if they've run their own company, whether or not it was successful, um, if they have a, a family, because that actually shows that they can manage a bunch of things, if they can have a family and still have a life, um, different things like that. If they, if they have um, military experience, if you can believe it, is a, a big plus. These people stay on schedule and obviously can follow orders, you know, worse orders than anything you're ever going to make them do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I'd say, I'd say age is a good thing, not a bad thing, especially the kind of people that go back to school and get their degrees and stuff. They tend to be very motivated. They're ready to, they took the time to stop their life a little later, go back, get some more skills, and they're hot to trot. They're ready for action. So I'd say it's a positive.